step up. He hit him. Now that'll really break it up. And the brawl is on because Pennant Fever is erupting here. There's no doubt about Moreland going after him because in that situation, he deliberately threw at him. There's no doubt about it. Oh, boy. Ed Lynch as uh, a Met, and then later was on that as you a Cub. that, that pitch? It got away. I didn't throw it. <laughs> <laughs> so that was in 84, and then you'd go on to play for the Cubs, and a decade after that fight, you'd be the general manager of the Chicago Cubs. Funny how things work out sure, in this game. Sure is. You know, I pitched for the 86 Mets. I pitched an inning, went on the DL, got traded to the Cubs. I pitched against the New York Mets that year. I pitched for them and against them. I started a game at Wrigley Field against Dwight Gooden later that year, and that was an interesting experience. Your story is great. Your background is fascinating. And for <laughs> folks unfamiliar, uh, you managed to work in a law degree in between all this baseball stuff before you kind of reinvented yourself as a front office exec. Yeah, you know, I, I finished as a player. I was 32 years old. I, you know, I'd never worked other than baseball. I, I graduated from college before I signed. So I'm 32 years old. I retired. I go home. What do I do now? So I applied to University of Miami Law School. I started in August of uh, 1988, and I graduated December of, of two, uh, no, excuse me, December of 1990. So two years and four months went full time. Would you have become uh -huh. uh, a GM? Would you have gone as far as you did as a baseball exec without that law degree? Or was that a big part of your? I think it was a big deal. part of my resume. I think people looked at it. Andy McPhail told me when he looked at it, showed a certain level of discipline, a certain level of being able to read the English language, which uh, <laughs> can be challenging at times. Something we take for granted here on exactly. this show, as a matter of <laughs> That's fact. Right. So yeah, I do, I do think it helped me. I do. Your first draft, and, and then we want to talk about the current game too, but uh, we were visiting about this before the show, and it's fascinating. Your first draft, as we mentioned, was 95. And now when we look back on it, uh, one or all of these guys would have had a completely different fate had you guys selected differently with that number four choice? Oh, absolutely. We all knew that Darren Erstadt was clearly the number one pick that year. Ben Davis was in the mix. It was a little bit of a surprise. But I remember Seattle was on, they were on the call. They were, they were next. And we were sitting there, and I remember thinking, if they take Kerry Wood, who are we taking? And we were going to take Todd Hilton. Wow. Mm. We were taking Todd Hilton. And Kerry Wood, uh, they took Jose Cruz Jr. We took Kerry Wood, and the rest is history. And I remember going to Todd Helton's number retiring ceremony in Colorado when they retired his number and thinking, he has no idea how close his life came to being totally different. <laughs> his end? He had no, and mine too. Yeah, yeah. You know, what we had to figure out, do we trade him, Mark Grace, which direction do we go? So, right. Wow. So why, why Kerry Wood? I mean, obviously Kerry was oh, phenomenal, was but. Every, what did every, you see? Did you go see him in no, high school? No, no. Uh, Andy McPhail was not big on the general manager going to see players. And I understood that, and I agreed with it. You know, I, we have a scouting staff in place. Those guys are professionals, decades of experience. I let them make the pick. But Kerry Wood, if you go back and talk to guys that saw him in high school, he was dominating. I mean, it was him. ridiculous. But, no brainer. but I remember we took him, and the, like two days later, he pitched the semifinal and the final game of the state tournament in the same day. Oh, and, going, and I what? was like, oh, my God, what is this coach doing? You know? <laughs> and the defense always says, well, I asked him if he was okay. And he said, yeah, well, let him be the coach then. You know? now, now, being a former pitcher yourself at the time and looking at this kid and seeing him, what, what were your projections when you're sitting there going, man, this guy's going to be pretty I, dumb? I remember the first time I saw him after he reported to our, our rookie team. And I remember standing on the side, and he was throwing in a bullpen. And he threw a fastball that looked like it was going to be in the dirt. And it just stayed on that plane and was whack right there knee high. And I remember thinking, that's the, my reaction the first time I saw Dwight Gooden throw a fastball mm. at that age. Mm. I mean, it just, and then he had that power hammer like Dwight did. But, uh, you know, he came up in his fifth start. His line score was 9 1 0 0 0 20. That Houston game. Yeah, it was, I mean, it's a ridiculous box. Cold score. afternoon at Wrigley Field. Little Drizzly. Seven, I want to say. Was 1998. 98. Uh, okay. I think it was his fifth major league start. Man, we could talk. I'd love to get all this backstory on players oh, that, that came through Wrigley when you were there. But I, I want to hit you with a couple of contemporary guys, too. Sure. Uh, and talk about some position changes that one we learned of. A few months ago, one we're just getting wind of, one's in Pittsburgh and in D.C. 
Uh, and let's start with what's happening in the Pittsburgh outfield because it's interesting. Clint Hurdle actually issued a statement. Uh, the Pirates front office. How about that? The manager had to issue a statement. He had no. to kind of clarify. This is, we've talked to these men in in my Clint speak. That's how yeah. he does it. Uh, what do you make of what's happening in that outfield now? Well, I'll tell you, Clint Hurdle really made this possible, I think. I think his level of respect with those players is unbelievable. You know, he's had all those guys since they were young players, came to the big leagues. And Clint is so respected, not only in the clubhouse, but in the community. So he probably sat down McCutcheon and said, this is why this works for you, it works for us. So Clint can't say enough about how, how Clint made this possible. The other guy who made this possible, obviously, is Andrew McCutcheon. I remember I saw him in Double A, maybe 2006, 2007, and I remember walking in there and talking to their front office people. He was 19, 20 years old, and they talked about him with such reverence. Like, this is the greatest kid we've ever had. Team leader, mm. plays hard all the time. So I think, you know, he's got 10 years of playing very, very hard in center field, and that's a huge center field in that ballpark. You know, he's a little thicker now than he was. Weren't we all at age 30? Oh boy. <laughs> so, I mean, Marte is a, an outstanding, gifted defensive center fielder. Polanco is a monster. He's going to be a big, strong, power left fielder. And their right field is a smaller place. It's a small place with that porch. Mm -hmm. So he's got less ground to cover. He's got less uh, stress on his legs. He had a knee problem last year that probably a lot of people don't know about. So I think it's going to help him offensively. I really do. Mm -hmm. But I got to say, and Harold and I were talking about this, if this is the worst uh, analytic defensive player in baseball, I'm a Chinese aviator. I mean, this is ridiculous. <laughs> hey, before we let you go, I, I also want to hit you on a guy moving from the outfield in. And we've seen shortstops move to center field yes. and have success. I'm thinking of Robin Yount. I know that's sure. the, the success outlier. But Trey Turner is going to have a lot of eyeballs on him this year and a lot of pressure on him in D.C. Well, I can't think of a young player that has more pressure on him than Trey Turner. Mm. I mean, they, they traded Danny Espinoza. There's not really a fallback position. I think, Harold, you said they're, they're going with him. He's the guy. Yeah. And, you know, anytime you move closer to the ball as a defender, it's a little scary. Mm. And so this guy put up huge numbers in center field. I mean, in half a year, this guy... Scored 53 runs, had 114 hits, OPS of 900, bat 342. But now his focus has to be on the second most demanding position on the field, which is shortstop. The well, other is catcher. And, and I think what's interesting in talking with you is you've, you're talking from experience because you saw him in the minor leagues. A lot of people did not see Trey play shortstop. I did. I saw him, and he was his, his situation was so unique. You know, he was traded as a player to be named later, and he knew he was traded, but they couldn't trade him because of the Incavilia rule. Yeah. So he's playing for the Padres AAA. He knows he's not going to be there after the day, anniversary of the day he signed. It was a weird situation. But I saw him struggle in the PCL at playing short, and um, he's a gifted player. He's played short his whole life, but now he's going back there after half a year playing center field on a team in contention you know, a perennial winner, a lot of pressure. It's going to be interesting. It's going to be interesting there and in uh, Pittsburgh for the reasons we discussed. Ed Lynch joining us on Hot Stuff. Good to see you, Eddie. Nice to have you around the last Good couple stuff. of days. Oh, thanks. You, thanks you're for having doing uh, some more shows today, too? Yeah, I think I've got uh, MLB now at 2 o'clock. Okay. All right. Good, lu good luck on that one. <laughs> thanks. <laughs>